The Emperor's Realm is a fortress forged of blood and bone, of fire and iron, and courage and hate. Its walls are the corpses of martyrs beyond count. Carrion mountains rise like foothills about them, the last remains of its myriad foes mingling with the dust of time itself. Neither can fell this endless edifice. The Imperium stands eternal. Sleep well, and enjoy the tale of the Saga Imperialis. But first, if you are interested in a completely ad-free Lord Asleep to experience, consider joining this channel. For just 99 cents a month, can get access to all past and future Lord Asleep 2 content absolutely ad-free, as well as an RSS feed to listen to Lord Asleep 2 on your favorite podcasting app, excluding Spotify. Click the join button to learn more. Ages of Mankind the road the human race has walked through history stretches long and bloody at their collective heels. Its origins are hidden by the swirling dust of eons. Its present wreathed in the flames of war. And ahead, the future yawns like a dark and forbidding pit. Still, Imperial historians do what they can to preserve the truth of humanity's journey, even if none may survive to read it. Beneath the Imperial Palace on Terra lie thousands of miles of catacombs, hushed vaults, and scroll-stuffed libraries. They are protected by rune-sealed bulkheads so formidable they could endure sustained orbital bombardment. Their guardians are shadowy terrors, unsleeping, ever vigilant. So vast is their sprawl that predatory things that have evolved amidst the shadows and the dust, ruling over trammeled ecosystems of pallid troglodyte vermin. The knowledge kept here, under lock and key, spans the great ages of humanity. Even this ultimate repository is moldering and much eroded by entropy's inescapable touch. Yet, just those fragmented records that remain would take many lifetimes to study, and contain secrets enough to blast the reader's sanity or bring the entire Imperium crashing down. It is well, perhaps, that few even know of the Endless Archive's existence. Fewer still are permitted beyond their doors. Age of Terra, M1 through M15. No record now remains of humanity's first faltering steps into the interstellar void. Yet step they did, their confidence and skill increasing until steps became strides, became bounding leaps through space. Ancient Earth became the shining hub of a powerful human realm, with Mars, the first world terraformed, standing proud as a bastion of technological innovation and scientific learning. Humanity's first encounters with alien races are not directly detailed, though fragments suggest that accords were struck with some, while wars were fought against others, most notably the ever-belligerent orcs. Little more can be said of this long-lost age of adventure and hope. Glimpses and echoes are all that survive. Age of Technology M15 through M25 
The first indications of human warp travel date from the early millennia of this age. They hinted gruesome disasters and many setbacks. Yet it is clear that eventually the technology was perfected. The cultivation of the navigator gene and the establishment of the navigator houses came soon after allowing vast leaps in interstellar travel, and the establishment of a full-blown human empire amongst the stars. As humanity's power and influence grew, so too did its hubris. The indomitable spirit of human endeavor has ever risen to the sternest challenges. Interstellar exploration, trade, and inevitably warfare presented challenges like nothing mankind had faced before. Planetary colonization proceeded at a ferocious rate. It seems likely that during this era the human race splintered and reformed time and again into warring or competing power blocks and planetary empires. But nothing could destabilize human space as a whole. Human scientists, engineers, inventors, and innovators became the new gods. They worked alien technologies into their race's devices to increase their efficacy with little thought to the risks. They modified their species' genome to ever greater degrees, fashioning vast armies of tailored gene troopers whose humanity was all but lost amidst the array of freakish alterations worked upon their bodies and minds. They invented standard template construct machines, or STCs, that allowed human colonists to rapidly fashion everything they needed to dominate new worlds from whatever natural resources were available. They developed sentient nanoplagues, world-sundering energy weapons, and endless ranks of fearsome men of iron that could be unleashed upon those who refused to bend their wills, alien and human alike. They fashioned thinking machines of vast intellect that administered to the every need of a colony world transformed into glittering utopian paradises. It was during this age also that humanity's psychic evolution is said to have accelerated a pace and therein lay the seeds of this first human empire's annihilation. Arch historians, chronopedants, and inquisitors of Ordo Hereticus have combined what scraps of information exist from this era and have agreed upon two things. First, that it is impossible now to separate fact from allegory. Second, that the first mentions of psychers appear around the end of M22 are near ubiquitous across humanity's worlds by late M23, and that absolute anarchy is said to have engulfed the worlds of mankind soon after. The collapse was sudden and appalling, a wave of apocalyptic catastrophe that was swept across human space. Terrible wars saw entire star systems scoured of life. Armies of mechanical soldiers marched against their creators and slaughtered billions. The scourge of mutation ran rampant, and everywhere psychic atrocities were unleashed. Everything from psychers claiming godhood over entire worlds to demonic possession and full-blown reality collapse. 
Then came the most ferocious warp storms that had been seen in all of mankind's history. Age of Strife M25 through M30 If the previous age had been one of prosperity and enlightenment, the Age of Strife was its dark mirror. It is hard for historians to separate fact from insane ramblings or prophecies of doom. But it appears that terrible wars raged across the length and breadth of humanity's galactic domain. Many worlds were consumed entirely, while even those whose populations endured were cut off from one another by the warp storms ravaging real space. During this era of isolation and hardship, many colonies underwent drastic and widespread mutations. Some were destroyed by it, for those mutations were the result of warp energies saturating their flesh and engulfing their worlds. Others underwent more natural processes of adaptation transforming into abhumans, such as ogrens, ratlings, stilt limbs, or beastmen. Many wondrous advancements were lost or fell into disrepair. Most of the STC technologies amongst them. Subjected to millennia of isolation, hardship, invasion, and horror, Countless worlds plunged into post-apocalyptic barbarism. Among them was Earth itself. Legend tells how the home world writhed in the grip of terrible wars beyond count. Techno-barbarians battled collectives of gene soldiers through the blazing ruins of once great arcologies. Cannibal savages unleashed unholy powers upon legions of cyborg zealots. Grand warlords, demagogues, and proto-deities rose and fell, each one threatening to finally take the planet and its people with them into damnation. And then, in humanity's darkest hour, came the Emperor. It was he who at last healed the terrible breaches between renamed Terra and rebellious Mars. It was he also who led the brutal campaign known as the Unification Wars at the head of armies of super soldiers known as Thunder Warriors. These were the precursors to the Emperor's mighty Space Marine Legions. And at their head, the Emperor cast down all rivals for the throne of Terra. Yet this was only the beginning of his endeavors. At last, the Age of Strife was over. Hope was restored. Yet hope has never been humanity's addiction, and curse both. Age of Darkness, M31 seeking to unify not just Terra, but rather all of humanity's lost domains. The Emperor gathered his might and launched the Great Crusade. Here was the single grandest undertaking mankind had ever known. Only one as charismatic and uncompromising as the Emperor could have even conceived of a plan so far-reaching. Mighty fleets departed Terra, vast space marine legions at their heads, and sweeping all resistance before them. In their wake came all the manifold agents of Imperial compliance, ready to impose the Emperor's secular truth upon what they were taught was an ignorant and fearful galaxy of misrule. It was the Emperor's vision that the Great Crusade would reclaim all the lost worlds of humanity 
and reunite them beneath his banner. Not only this, but all Xeno species would be purged mercilessly from the galaxy, and all resistance to Imperial rule crushed. Only in this way, the Emperor claimed, could the dark tragedies of the past be prevented from occurring again. The Great Crusade swept the stars for more than a hundred years, pushing always outward and bringing ever more systems and worlds into the nascent Imperium. Yet the seeds of disaster were planted at the very heart of the Emperor's designs. Before beginning his labors, he had first fashioned the Primarchs, a brotherhood of alchemically engineered demigods from whose genetic material the gene seed of the Space Marines Legion was created. Before they could be truly born, however, the Dark Gods discovered the Emperor's designs and contrived to snatch away the Primarch's incubation pods and cast them adrift upon the tides of the warp. Each Primarch landed upon a different planet, scattered far and wide across humanity's ancient domains, and grew to maturity amongst the people of their adoptive worlds. As the Great Crusade pushed out across the stars, the Primarchs were rediscovered and repatriated into the Imperium. Each was given leadership of the legions their gene seed had created, and charged to lead them as the Emperor's vision dictated. It was the Emperor's favored son, Warmaster Horus of the Luna Wolves Legion, who first turned. Even as humanity stood upon the brink of triumph, he was seduced by the whispers and lies of the Dark Gods and turned in wrath upon his father's empire. Horus led fully half of his Primarch brothers into damnation alongside him and plunged the Imperium into the worst civil war mankind had ever known. This dark and terrible conflict raged from one end of the galaxy to the other, pitting brother against brother, and Space Marine Legion against Space Marine Legion, until at last it was decided at the cataclysmic Siege of Terra itself. It was during that final battle that the Emperor felled Horus at last, and drove his traitor legions into exile, but not before the war master had mortally wounded his sire. So was the emperor confined to the golden throne. So was the imperium sundered, never to be truly whole again. So began hope's slow death. Remnants of a dark age. The Imperium of the 41st Millennium is a deeply superstitious realm, its people bound in shackles of ignorance and blinded against dangerous truths. Atavistic terror and religious disgust characterize its attitudes to the mechanical innovation, stemming from the barely remembered horrors of the Dark Age of Technology. Technology is but dimly understood by the mass of humanity. Be they erudite scholars, military heroes, the pilots of spacecraft, or ragged serfs. The majority of mankind attributes the operation of technology to fickle machine spirits that must be beseeched with the proper rituals of activation and appeased with offerings of sanctified oil, sacred unguents, and the like. Only the Magi of the Adeptus Mechanicus possess true repositories of technological lore. 
They hoard all they have gathered in towering data stacks deep within the industrial sprawls of their fortified factory planets known as Forge Worlds. Yet even these insular priests make no distinction between technical blueprint and sacred scripture component and holy relic. Their prayers are delivered in blaring binaric cant, their repairs conducted as incense-wreathed rituals, and the construction of their revered machines performed by rote rather than understanding. Experimentation and invention are considered tantamount to heresy. The doctrines of their machine god, the Omnissiah, grew out of the terrors of the Age of Strife and warn of the dangers of rampant innovation. Knowledge lost to the ravages of time remain lost for the terror of tech heresy, or at least its discovery and the subsequent punishment, is greater by far and the dread of ignorance. For all this, the Adeptus Mechanicus holds vast power in the Imperium, which is reliant upon technology to survive. There is a reason that worship of the Omnissiah is the only officially tolerated religion besides the Imperial Creed. Nor do the Adeptus Mechanicus view the acquisition of lost technologies to be in any way equivalent to the sin of fashioning devices anew. There is an irony long lost on the tech priests that they hunt rapaciously for even the slightest fragments of ancient human artifice, many of which are examples of the very Dark Age technology so reviled by their own creeds. Such relics of the Omnissiah are viewed as sacred treasures. Armies are readily sacrificed to ensure their acquisition. Most precious of all are the remnants of standard template construct machines that have survived the millennia. These remarkable STCs allow auto-fabrication of devices that humanity can well use in their war for survival. Many of the Imperium's most ubiquitous weapons and war engines are still produced in this fashion. The Imperial Creed is as damning of unsanctioned technology as it is of mutation or rebellion. Many allegorical parables warn against the horrors of artificial intelligence. Such thinking machines are regarded with horror and are banned even amongst the Adeptus Mechanicus. The average Imperial citizen views tech heresy as akin to witchcraft, and reacts with equal intolerance to either. Some human worlds play host to ancient sites where the remains of dark technology lurk, but these are shunned as cursed by those forced to live in their shadows. Xenos technology is even further mistrusted. Even the most replicable and galaxy-changing innovations are typically shunned if they are of alien origin. There are exceptions. Dangerous Archaeotech finds its way up from the lawless roots of hive cities or mine workings after being excavated by labor gangs. Fringe world colonists, who take a more pragmatic approach to survival than most, trade with neighboring Xeno species, and in doing so, introduce Xenotech to these sprawling imperial black markets. Such dangerous prizes are sought out by the various Ordos of the Inquisition, of course, as are their suppliers for the damage that these deviant devices can cause in the wrong hands does not bear imagining. 
legacy of strife. The human race bears deep scars upon their collective psyche thanks to the horrors of the Age of Strife, which ground on for almost six millennia. Mankind survived its ravages in only the most fragmented and desperate fashion. Emerging from its shadows and into the Emperor's light as a species much changed. The collapse of society during the Age of Strife brought a violent end to millennia of human confidence. It shattered the species' sense of galactic destiny. Never before had there been a peril or challenge human ingenuity could not best. Worse, the dangers that laid mankind low came from within, unmarked until it was too late. The damage done to the gestalt human psyche by thousands of years of galactic catastrophe ran so deep as to become instinct, mistrust of curiosity and invention, of alien influence and psychic witchcraft predominated. Humanity became close-minded and violently conservative desperate to avoid repetition of the mistakes that had led to the horrors of the Age of Strife. Where lore and record-keeping failed, mythology and religion kept those fears alive. Perhaps this explains the fervor with which the Emperor's Great Crusade was greeted. Though, of course, countless warlords and isolationist societies fought his rule, the Emperor's unification brought a safe and secular comfort that banished the ghosts haunting the human soul. If this is truth, then it would also explain why the Emperor's fall saw the specters rush back in with such vengeance. Fearful and bereft, Humanity sought strength in the blind zealotry that the Emperor himself had so assiduously discouraged, becoming ever more entrenched in their superstitions over time. The Age of Strife even scarred the galaxy itself. Countless worlds were reduced to inimical wastelands or overrun by dangerous living weapons. Others were left haunted by the Cyclopean ruins of lost endeavor. Vast halos of decaying orbital machinery, looming spires crackling with strange energies, echoing tech vaults still concealing deadly threats behind bulkheads buried in the dust of ages. Every time the Imperium discovers another such remnant of its former glory, it is but another reminder of the hubris that damned humanity and the dangers of daring to hope in such a dark and terrible age. Age of Darkness The Horus Heresy tore the Imperium in two, pitted brother against brother, and saw countless Imperial worlds burn. Yet, for all the devastation and death that occurred across the span of that dreadful conflict, its after-effects were perhaps even more catastrophic, echoing down through the ages even unto the 41st millennium. Many dreams died when the Emperor was sealed within the Golden Throne. Mankind was shorn of his guidance. Lost, too, was the wisdom of the Emperor's Vizier, Malkador the Sigilite, who perished during the last battle for Terra. And more than half of the Primarchs lost either to death or betrayal. Their surviving Loyalist siblings 
vanished one by one, fading into history and leaving humanity ever more bereft. It was left to the High Lords and the Imperial Cult to do what they could in the Emperor's stead. The Age of Darkness cost the Imperium its wisest minds, but more than that, it also shattered what certainties humanity had managed to rebuild. The secular imperial truth was undone. Horus's dark pacts and otherworldly allies had exposed the malevolent Empyrean for all to see. Only through brutal repression and religious dogma could this knowledge be prevented from corroding humanity's soul. Thus began a spiral of enforced ignorance that cost humanity dear. Trust, too, was a casualty of the heresy. The Space Marines had been humanity's protectors, the Primarchs its mightiest champions. If one as trusted as Warmaster Horus could turn, who among the legions Astartes could ever be relied upon again? Historians point to such sentiments as the catalysts for the sweeping reforms that fragmented the Imperial war machine in the Heresy's wake. It was Ultramarines Primarch Rebute Gilliman himself who penned the Codex Astartes, the sacred text whose implementation saw the vast Space Marine legions split into parent chapters and their successors to ensure that never again could any one warlord wield such a concentration of martial might. The Imperial Army and Navy were both massively compartmentalized, spread across the Imperium's vast reaches, and commanded by layer upon layer of officers and bureaucrats. The Orados of the Inquisition kept watch over humanity's rulers from the shadows, while draconian new laws aimed to ensure that rebellion on the scale of the heresy could never occur again. In the wake of the Age of Darkness, there was hope again for a time, albeit hope of a bloody-minded and insular sort very different from that inspired by the Great Crusade. Yet, as the years ground on and brought new hardships and perils with them, that hope was replaced by unthinking authoritarian dogma and the simple determination to survive for survival's sake. There are those who say that though the body of the Imperium survived the Horus heresy and recovered from its wounds, the soul of mankind never did. Age of the Imperium the rising tide of horrors that crashes against humanity's bastions in the 41st millennium has done so for thousands of years. After the Age of Darkness came a period of hardship as Xenos invaders and piratical raiders preyed upon the weakened Imperium. Though repulsed time and again, their attacks have never ceased. Throughout M32, humanity struggled not only to recover what it had lost, but to retain its grip upon that which it still held. Invasions and separatist uprisings took their toll as the High Lords strove to defend their scattered domains. The last loyal Primarchs were lost during this turbulent era. Jagatai Khan of the White Scars Layman Russ of the Space Wolves vanished into the stars while hunting their foes, while Vulcan of the Salamanders and Korax of the Raven Guard disappeared under more mysterious circumstances. Rogal Dorn of the Imperial Fists was said to have fallen in battle with the traitor legions. 
while his brother Rebute Gilliman of the Ultramarines was laid low by Fulgrim, demon primarch of the Emperor's children. Gilliman was spirited away from battle and encased in a shimmering stasis field that preserved him in a long sleep through the millennia to come. Through M33 and M34, the Adeptus Terra secured an ever more ironclad grip on power. Many of the astropathic sanctums that transmit messages even today were established during this era, as were a great number of the fortress worlds and deep space naval bases that still watch over subsectors of Imperial space. Over the same period of time, the Imperial Creed became the sanctioned religion of the Emperor's realm. The mailed fists of bureaucracy and religion took a tight hold of mankind's reins, and for a time they endured, even prospered. Then came the era of Nova Terra Interregnum. For over 900 years, the Imperium was split in two, after the Ur Council of Nova Terra claimed sovereign rule of the entire Segmentum Pacificus, also known as the Time of the Two Emperors. This turbulent period of Imperial history saw countless civil wars, uprisings, and trade disputes. Documentation from this era suggests that many such disturbances had their roots in heretical subversion. Though heavy redaction by the Ordos Malleus makes it hard to say for certain. A legacy of mistrust and prejudice lingered long after the Imperium reunification, such that even in M41, the Segmentum Pacificus is still the most under-resourced in the Imperium. What followed in M36 has become known as the Age of Apostasy, for it saw devastating religious schisms threaten the very survival of the Imperium. Goge Van Dyer's Reign of Blood very nearly brought the Imperium to its knees, and saw the worst internecine Imperial conflict since the Age of Darkness. It was followed by the horrors of the Plague of Unbelief, a galaxy-wide uprising of corrupt demagogues that saw the followers of the Dark Gods wreak havoc. In the wake of such heresy and strife, the era from M37 to M41 became known as the Age of Redemption. Crusade after Crusade, was launched by Imperial forces, many of them penitent in nature and oath sworn to reclaim those worlds lost to infighting, heretical overthrow, or Xenos invasion in prior centuries. The Imperium knew many victories during this era, yet the zealous fervor that drove mankind's armies onward had scant regard for the sustainability of the worlds at won. The Makarian conquests were arguably the last and greatest of these crusades, for they saw a thousand worlds claimed for the Imperium in just seven years. Yet the subsequent collapse into rebellion and heresy of those same worlds was characteristic of the years that followed, a period known as the Waning, in which the overextended and martially exhausted Imperium saw control begin to slip from its grasp. The rule of Imperian law became ever more draconian in response. Importance of doom were both incessant and relentless. The prescient foretold great ripples in the warp like the water disturbed by a colossal but unseen menace. Darkness 
was coming for the Emperor's realm. The Alien Tides For as long as humanity has sailed the stars, they have encountered alien races. These races, broadly classified as Xenos by the Adeptus Terra, have on occasion proved valuable allies alongside whom to battle mutual foes. More often, by far, they are themselves the enemy, and must be fought to the death, lest they butcher, devour, or enslave the worlds of mankind. For 10,000 years, from the westernmost reaches of the Segmentum Pacificus to the most far-flung listening stations of the eastern fringe, the Imperium has made war upon myriad alien races and has been made war upon in its turn. To an authoritarian regime such as the Adeptus Terra, there is little room for ambiguity when it comes to the hated Xenos, and no consideration given to the possible benefits of alliance or truce with any of them. That which is inhuman is unclean, and must therefore be destroyed. The realities of combat in the field are rarely as binary, however. On many occasions throughout its long history, the armies of the Imperium have found common cause with the more comprehensible Xeno species, even on occasion those deemed monstrous, when faced with yet worse perils. In particular, this is true of the craft world Eldari, or the mysterious Harlequins, with whom many temporary accords have been struck. Yet, even these pacts seem always to manipulate mankind's destiny in unforeseen ways. Aware of the eldritch abilities of the Aldari, plentiful Imperial commanders have embraced a mutual annihilation on their own terms, rather than set aside their ingrained xenophobia. The wars against the Orc Menace have been comparatively simple, if at times utterly devastating. Setting aside the odd, unconfirmed report of illicit trade with alleged green-skinned sub-factions, humanity and the Orcs have been at one another's throats nearly constantly for the best part of ten millennia. The orc race is so incredibly prolific that few indeed are the star systems without at least a hint of green skin presence. Moreover, these crude and anarchic aliens are so aggressive that to encounter them at all is to find oneself embroiled in an immediate and rapidly escalating war that it soon becomes clear as being fought as much for the orc's sheer enjoyment as for any coherent material gain. Such sudden and senseless conflicts are bad enough, but Imperial history is littered with examples of those times when greenskin numbers have reached critical mass upon some world or system, and a wag has begun. From the notorious War of the Beast to the Second and Third Armageddon Wars, and the unstoppable advance of the Arc Arsonist of Charadon, such occasions have seen the Imperium virtually brought to its knees by this brutal and widespread foe. Some Xenos threats to the Imperium are more ancient than humanity itself. This is true of the myriad Eldari factions, but equally so of their ghoulish nemesis of old, the Necrons. Imperial historians know little of the origins of this race of murderous alien androids, and much of the knowledge they have successfully gathered has been delivered by the arrogant and often insane overlords of the Necrons themselves, casting its veracity into doubt. 
It is certain, however, that the Necron race plunged themselves into millennia of hibernation long ago, perhaps seeking to outlast or evade some deadly foe. Now they are awakening again, their buried complexes of stasis tombs rumble into life deep beneath the surface of countless worlds scattered across the galaxy. The inquisitors of the Ordo Xenos suggest that the Necron race is fractured into many factions, and that thanks to the ravages of time, it has emerged from its long sleep damaged in both body and mind. For all this, the Necrons are a terrifying and infallible foe. Conflicts such as the battle for the ice-locked war zone Damnos have proved to the Imperium that nothing short of an overwhelming military response stands any chance of overcoming the Necrons' eldritch technologies or the shackled godlike beings that they goad into battle. By comparison, the Imperium also faces Xenos threats that are comparatively young and vital, or else have only made their appearance upon the galactic stage of late. When explorator ships first marked the homeworld of the Xenos race classified as the Tau, they found a relatively primitive society that were marked for a potential further study or exploitation and then ignored. The next the Imperium saw of the Tau was when the alien's technology advanced and ideologically driven empire surged into the eastern fringe. How the Tau could have possibly advanced so swiftly was beyond the kin of the Adeptus Mechanicus and thus swiftly put down to monstrous alien heresy. A more pertinent question appeared to be how to best drive them back. The most serious attempt yet by the Imperium to do so has come to be known as the Damocles Crusade, and at best that bloody and protracted war could be adjudged to a draw. Unable to keep pace with the rapid maneuvering of Tau forces, and in constant danger of losing outlying populations to the utopian promises of the aliens' water-cast diplomats, Imperial commanders were at last forced to enact a broad frontage annihilation protocol that employed ancient Adeptus Mechanicus technology to mutually deny a firebreak of worlds in the path of the Tau advance. It was a desperate act that put an end to a desperate war. But it seems unlikely that this is the last the Imperium will see of the dynamic Tau Empire. In the meanwhile, however, the Tyranids had begun to assail the fringes of the galaxy and it rapidly became clear to the beleaguered Imperium that here was a new terror to rival any alien they had faced before. Descending in vast and rapacious swarms, the Tyranids appeared at first to be little more than predatory animals, incredibly dangerous certainly, but limited by their lack of higher intelligence or motivation. Yet, as more and more Tyranid tendrils push into the galaxy, as the high fleets adapt rapidly to each new military encounter, seed mutant cults through the Imperium societies and react with ominous cunning to each fresh attempt to understand or destroy them. And understanding has spread through the Ordo Xenos and beyond that these aliens are driven by some vast hive mind it seems focused on the eradication of all non-Tyranid life in the galaxy. All races must now face this terrible threat if they wish to survive. But with the great rift sundering the stars, and the agents of the Dark Gods spreading death and anarchy through every sector of Imperial space, can any one power truly muster the strength to turn back the Tyranid tide.
the horrors of chaos. Time passes strangely in the warp, and its corrupting energies make a mockery of that which the human race considers possible. So it is that those same traitor legions who pitted themselves against the throne world 10,000 years ago still endure, sustained by sheer bitterness, the fires of their hatred of the emperor unquenched by the long passage of years. The Imperium has known countless foes over its millennia-long existence. Many have come and gone, their own power waxing and waning. Others have prevented sudden and shocking threats to the Emperor's realm, but once vanquished have vanished into the teetering mountains of data scrolls and ledgers entombed beneath the Emperor's palace on Terra. Only one enemy has remained a constant and omnipresent threat throughout the last 10,000 years. And there is a grim irony that it is an enemy of humanity's own making. These are the traitor legions, the heretic Astartes, the dreaded Chaos Space Marines. Hounded across the galaxy by vengeful Imperial armies, Horus' traitors were forced to take refuge in the Eye of Terror, a vast interstitial area of space between the warp and real space. Plunging into the anarchic tides of this tainted region, they fractured and degenerated into a nightmarish plethora of ways. Some legions, Angron's blood-mad world eaters, and the ever-anarchic Night Lords chief amongst them, shattered entirely into the countless warbands, each led by their own dangerously ambitious champion. Others, such as Perturabo's relentless Iron Warriors, retained much of their martial structure, but were corrupted body and soul by the ruinous powers. During the horrors of the heresy, a number of the Primarchs had pledged themselves and their legions to a particular dark god, and now those monstrous beings became the rulers of their own demon worlds. Horus had united the traitor legions, with the Warmaster dead, the insanity of chaos all around them and the promise of unlimited power tantalizingly within their reach, the defeated renegades fell upon one another and anyone else unfortunate enough to stand in their way, and thought only of walking the bloody path to glory. Despite all this, the unifying factor that the traitor legions retained was their hatred of the Imperium. Whether they believed that they had truly fought upon the right side of an ideological conflict, had been embittered by the loss of their beloved heroes or battle brothers during the fighting, resented their martial defeat at the eleventh hour or had simply descended into murderous insanity hardly mattered. To the traitors, the war was far from over, and their determination to see Terra burn was greater than ever. So began the Long War. It began with sporadic raiding by chaos-worshipping heretic Astarte warbands against Imperial holdings bordering the Eye of Terror. With few stable warp routes in or out of this malevolent realm, smaller raiding parties could slip in and out with impunity, but larger forces had to attempt to pass through the Cadian Gate, centered around the fortress world of Cadia itself. This massively defended region had been established specifically to hold back the potential threat of a major traitor invasion of Imperial space, and it did its job well despite the cost. Yet, as the centuries ground past, 
the worshippers of the Dark Gods found other ways to strike at the Imperium. Agents of misrule moved from world to world, establishing cults in the shadows and spurring bloody insurrection wherever Imperial vigilance faltered. The whispering lure of ruinous power turned formerly loyal Space Marine chapters renegade, each such fallen brotherhood weakening the defenses of the Imperium even as it strengthens the cause of the Dark Gods. Particularly determined or favored champions forged temporary alliances between Chaos Warbands and rode the tides of the warp wherever that might take them, emerging into Imperial space aboard tainted warships or monstrous space hulks to rave and murder at will. The Imperium fought back, of course. For centuries, the heretic Astartes were just another of the dangers that beset humanity. Terrible, certainly, so much so that the Inquisition fought to suppress the very knowledge of their existence, lest it incite panic and heresy. Yet, divided and ever at one another's throats, the traitors stood no better chance of overthrowing the Imperium than did any of the other forces that battered at humanity's defenses year in and year out. Yet that was all to change. When Horus fell, his chief lieutenant Abaddon had the Primarch's body borne away and held the sons of Horus together long enough to reach the Eye of Terror. What occurred beyond the precipice of real space is a matter of conjecture and guesswork to those few Imperial scholars who dare address the subject at all. What is known from records, however, is that near the end of M31, Abaddon the Despoiler emerged again from the Eye of Terror, leading his renamed Black Legion and dozens of allied Chaos Warbands in the first of his apocalyptic Black Crusades. The tide of screaming lunatics, twisted mutants, demonic warriors, and hellish war engines brought havoc throughout the Cadian Gate before they were at last turned back at terrible cost of lives. Yet, incredibly, in the bleak light of hindsight, it seems likely that the entire war was but a distraction, during which Abaddon was able to travel in secret to the world of Uralon and claim the demon sword Drachnian. This, along with the mighty talon of his own slain gene sire, he would use to butcher the servants of the Emperor in their thousands. This was only the beginning, as the millennia ground on the despoiler struck again and again against the Imperium. Twelve more Black Crusades bedeviled the Emperor's realm. Some greater, some smaller, but each working towards some ineffable goal that only Abaddon himself truly understood. The shrine of Saint Gerstal was despoiled and the prophetic words in his tomb erased from existence. The citadel of the Cromarch was breached and the entire line put to death. The forge world of Arkreath was annihilated. The naval fortress at Cancephalus crushed, and the Gothic sector plunged into unrelenting war. Always, Abaddon demonstrated terrifying foreknowledge of the Imperium's defenses, and strove to achieve goals that his enemies did not understand until it was far too late. Only when the Great Rift roared into being and the Imperium shuddered as it was split in two, did those few cursed with knowledge see the truth of what Abaddon and his heretic Astartes had striven to achieve? The Gathering Storm The opening of the Great Rift was presaged by an era of dark portents and momentous happenings. Seers and mystics went mad with fear, raving about an unstoppable confluence of events and of black storm clouds gathering to blot out the light of hope. It was a time of desperate heroics, of grand triumphs and bitter defeats. 
all turning about the inescapable wheel of fate. Dramatic events occurred in the later years of M41, directly preceding the opening of the Great Rift. The galactic mayhem that followed has left the Adeptus Terra struggling to piece together what really happened. It does not help that many accounts sound more like scripture or myth than tangible fact, or that Terra was subjected to a tidal wave of astropathic distress cries that may, in some cases, have dated from thousands of years in the past or even from unspecified but horrifying fragments of the future. Nor is the burden of reckoning events made lighter by the fact that some of the trails of casualty and fate may lead back through millennia now, all but lost to time's corrosive embrace. Perhaps it will never truly matter, as the Imperium struggles to weather the worst storm since Horus's fall, there are few enough adepts free to concern themselves with understanding the whys or hows of the rift's opening. Comprehension is a dangerous luxury in an era where nothing but the fight for survival matters. For all this, there are those who have pieced together what they can. These scholars point to a series of loosely interconnected happenings, each significant enough itself to warrant entire pages in the historians' accounts, yet vastly more important as a whole than the sum of their parts. The return of the planet of sorcerers from beyond the Veil of the Warp, the scorching of space during the devastating culmination of the Democles Crusade, the vicious disjunction that tore through the dimensional sub-realms of Kamorag, the shattering of the last chains that bound shut the crystal tome within the halls of the Black Library, the sundering of the Amethal Demon Cage, all of these happenings punch their own ragged tears in the weft and weave holding reality and the warp apart. And any of these, or countless others like them, could have been the pivotal blow that split the galaxy in two. Yet the three most likely epicenters for this galactic shockwave are the fortress world of Cadia, the Aldari craft world of Biotan, and the Ultramarine's chapter planet of Macrag in the heart of Ultramar. In that portentous time, war-torn Cadia became the stage for the final battle of a conflict that had raged for a millennia. For thousands of years, the hordes of chaos had hurled themselves against the Cadian Gate. From the Gudrun system to the naval base at Bellus Corona, the fighting had raged, yet always it was Cadia that had borne the brunt of one traitor offensive after another. And always the redoubtable fortress world had held. Yet, in this dark hour, Abaddon the Despoiler came against the planet again. And this time, he led so impossibly vast a coalition of traitors, demons, and renegades that even the Kassar fortresses of Cadia could not withstand their fury. Though great imperial leaders and countless mighty armies rallied to the planet's defense, though winged Saint Celestine swept down from the firmament to aid the planet in its hour of need, and Belisarius' call turned his unimaginably vast intellect to its defense, it was not enough. Abaddon laid waste to Cadia, and in so doing, destroyed the ancient Noctilith pylons that had for so long held the Eye of Terror itself in check. Far too late did the Imperium understand the true power of those prehistoric Xeno structures. Far too late did they wonder whether more such pylons had existed upon other worlds that Abaddon had ravaged during his millennia of war. 
By the time such questions were asked, catastrophe had already been unleashed. The sundering of craft world Biotan was equally unforeseen disaster, one that sent shockwaves through all the scattered branches of the Aldari race. Imperial comprehension of how or precisely why the craft world met its end is hazy to say the least, and much of the knowledge possessed is sealed behind layers of inquisitorial security protocols. It is apparent only that within the ancient Xenos race arose a sect preaching of an ancient death god, and that their coming factionalized, and continues to factionalize, the Aldari entire, from Kamorag to the most distant maiden worlds. Years of desperate maneuvering, factional infighting, and the bloody manipulation of countless strands of fate were to culminate in a vicious demonic onslaught against craft world Biotan, and its subsequent shattering. That this same event somehow manifested the corporeal avatar of the Eldari god of death is beyond question. But what other devastating effects it created both in the warp and through the fabric of real space remain in question. The most incredible happening of all those in this turbulent period, at least from the Imperial point of view, took place upon Macrag, within the fortress monastery of the renowned Ultramarines chapter. A heady mixture of eyewitness accounts, barely coherent scriptural logs, and much embellished mythology tells how, even as a host of Abaddon's own Black Legion, led a devastating attack against McCrag. An uneasy alliance of disparate champions from across the galaxy converged along paths of fate to thwart them. With them, they brought strange lore and ineffable machines that they would use to work a miracle. Even as battle raged at the very foot of his stasis throne, the Primarch Rabute Gilliman was healed brought back at last from the brink of death to lead his gene sons in the hour of their greatest need. Gilliman drove the Chaos worshippers from his world before embarking upon a desperate crusade of his own. He reached Terra upon the very wings of the Great Rift's devastating warp storms, and from there began his furious battle to save his father's realm from annihilation. Age of the Dark Imperium Ten thousand years have passed since the Emperor ascended to the Golden Throne. Ten thousand years of hardship, toil, loss, and horror. Still, mankind fights on, clinging to their faith in the God Emperor, and their belief that one day he will deliver them. Were such to happen, it would be a miracle on a scale unprecedented in human history, for the darkness enveloping the Imperium has never been deeper. Most of the galaxy's sentient races have prophecies of doom, the time when these stars will be extinguished and the void consume all. The Rana Dandra of the Eldari the hollowing of the Nikasar, the Tau Empire's carefully suppressed terror of a plunge back into the final violence of the Montau. Humanity has known many apocalyptic predictions that no single scholar could collate them all in a lifetime. Always they have been averted or proven false. Yet, as the 41st millennium accelerates towards what must surely be a catastrophic conclusion, the peoples of the galaxy could be forgiven for believing that the end has truly come. The Great Rift did worse than simply disunite the Empire. It bifurcated it, severing Sanctus from Nihilus as surely as a clean sword stroke will lop off a warrior's head. Its erupting warp storms swallowed hundreds of star systems whole, 
along with countless indigenous species. It distorted the flow of time and causality and vomited tides of uncontrolled energies into the void. Humanity was perhaps the worst affected race. The sheer scope and scale of its holdings and its desperate reliance upon the Astronomicon rendering it uniquely vulnerable. To the Adeptus Terra, the worlds lost beyond the rift may as well have ceased to exist. Along with the reinforcements, resources, and intelligence they supplied. It is just as possible for those denizens besieged upon the lost worlds of the Imperium Nihilus to believe that they are the last humans left alive. These sundered fragments of humanity might take heart if they could see how hard they all continue to fight. For every world lost to madness, despair, or catastrophe, another battles on even now. Their watchful pyres burning high and their hymnals ringing defiantly out into the darkness of the void. After all, mankind has not survived 10,000 years of strife by being weak or quick to admit defeat. The ages that came before have tempered the Imperium. They have instilled both strengths and weaknesses in the Emperor's teeming flock. Humanity's ignorance has long been a blight. Technological innovation might allow them to resurrect countless vital weapons, defenses, communication systems, perhaps even to repair the faltering mechanisms of the Golden Throne itself. With greater knowledge of the dangers they face, could mankind perhaps adapt better or employ those insights to combat the manifold threats? A less superstitious and ignorant human race would be swifter to react, more versatile and adaptable, would perhaps even set aside its crippling prejudices long enough to forge common cause with the more amenable alien races, and thus gain powerful allies in the war against chaos. Yet perhaps ignorance, fear, and superstition are the Imperium's saving graces. The downtrodden masses provide an endless supply of military manpower and industrial toil against which more empowered populations would rebel. Too much knowledge is a dangerous thing when battling eldritch horrors such as the ancient Necrons or the insidious demons of chaos. Against such foes, unthinking faith is the brightest burning blade and the most indomitable shield. Perhaps the macabre edifice that humanity has become is ideally suited to surviving this darkest hour. Yet, if that is so, then what price is victory? Perhaps it makes no odds either way. The galactic war has a momentum all of its own, and the sheer scale of the Imperium's war defies human control or comprehension. Even the greatest individuals can do little to change the course of matters at this point. Mired in darkness and uncertainty, they can only do their best to drive back the most dire of threats as they appear, and to hold the Emperor's realm together under the ever-increasing pressure. The Indominus Crusade When he reached Terra, the Ultramarine's Primarch Rabute Gilliman came before his father, the God Emperor of Mankind. What transpired behind the closed doors of the Emperor's throne room is not recorded but it is said that Gilliman emerged with new purpose burning in his gaze. He would not sit idle while the great rift poisoned the stars. Even the soul system was besieged in the wake of the great rift's opening. Only the combined efforts of many imperial armies saw the throne world preserved and the enemies of mankind hurled back yet again. 
By this time, Rabute Gilliman had had the chance to see well the strength that remained in the Imperial War Machine. He now appreciated, better than ever, the might that the beleaguered Imperium could still bring to bear when fighting in concert. It was this strength he intended to set against the horrors revealed as the darkness of Noctis Eterna faded at last. It is said that Robute Gilliman struggled every day not to draw his sword, gather his loyal warriors, and simply plunge into the maelstrom of battle. Such was his dismay at the condition of the Imperium and his hatred of the traitor foe. Instead, displaying the ability to rationalize and compartmentalize for which he was rightly famed, Gilliman held his ground and set into motion a plan that he hoped would allow him to win not a handful of battles, but rather humanity's desperate war for survival. Gilliman viewed the wider galactic battlefield with a perspective no mere mortal mind could achieve. First and foremost, he recognized that the Imperium Sanctus must be made secure before any most desperate thought could be given to the Imperium Nihilus. Secondly, with a dispassion many called cruelty, he concluded that every world could not be fought for or saved. If the Imperium was to stand a chance, it must amass its overwhelming strength as best it could, and then apply it strategically and methodically. So began the mustering of the Indominus Crusade fleets, the greatest military undertaking by the human race since the Great Crusade had departed Terra 10,000 years before. The muster could not happen overnight, nor could it occur without resistance and difficulty. Gilliman secured the agreement of the High Lords easily enough, for they saw in his plan a chance to restore sanity and stability to a galaxy turned to madness. The Primarch had to work harder to secure the support of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Adeptus Custodes, the Guilds of Navis Nobilite, the ponderous bureaucratic might of the Adeptus Terra, and countless others. He faced organized resistance, not only from those cells of Chaos worshippers and xenophile cults that festered in Terra's underhives, but also from pompous and politicking nobles too used to being the masters of their own petty domains. Gilliman was as tireless as he was merciless in crushing and purging these obstacles to his plan. The diplomatic and military onslaught he unleashed through every strata of the throne world soon became known as the Primarch's Scourge, and though it won him few friends, it also ensured that the muster of the Indominus Crusade fleets proceeded apace. That muster was achieved in part by the vast material output of Terra, Mars, Jupiter, and more distant worlds such as Armageddon, Astrofall, and Senjin. As much if not more military strength was garnered through withdrawing vast forces from those systems in the Imperium Sanctus that were deemed untenable. This latter process spawned a great deal of resentment and more than one mutiny by warriors unwilling to abandon their posts. But it succeeded in providing vast numbers of battle-hardened warriors and war machines for the growing crusade fleets. Those fleets were now taking shape at designated muster points around the Sol system, the Gehenna system, and several others. Gilliman had created a new administrative body called the Officio Logisticarum, and it was this army of scribes, diplomats, macro tallyers, and others that smoothed the integration of elements from every strand of the Imperial War Machine into vast, self-sufficient, and coordinated military forces. Gilliman's plan envisioned an initial wave of ten Indominus Crusade fleets, codified Fleet Primus, Fleet Secondus, Fleet Tertius, and so on. 
though varying enormously in composition and size, each fleet had its own assigned grand strategic mission, determined by Gilliman himself to interlock into a robust counteroffensive strategy intended to prevent the final collapse of the Imperium. It was Fleet Tertius that departed first, slipping its moorings and plunging into battle before the muster fleets of Sectus and Octus had even commenced. Tertius was loosed to meet a vast, coronate crusade of slaughter on a collision course with the Sol system. Before arcing out into the Segmentum Pacificus, with a view to swinging thence into the Segmentum Tempestus. Fleet Secondus departed Terra next, taking the Martyr's Road straight toward the Eye of Terra. Only once he was sure that his plan had gathered unstoppable momentum, Gilliman at last allowed himself to strike out at the head of Fleet Primus and begin reinforcing the Imperium Sanctus one world at a time. Age of Witches The opening of the Great Rift had many obvious and catastrophic effects. It brought a more insidious peril, too, one that spread slowly across the stars and tainting all it touched. The warp had been laid open like flayed flesh. The boundaries of real space rent apart on a scale never before seen. It was inevitable, perhaps, that its energies would flow like blood from those wounds. After the Great Rift opened, the darkness of Noctis Aeterna hid many evils. Psychic cataclysms and demonic accursions consumed dozens of worlds. As the darkness cleared, the Adeptus Terra developed a clearer picture of the horrors that had been wrought. They looked on aghast. Little did they realize the phenomena they witnessed were but the first of the unnatural manifestations to plague this new dark age. The truth of what was happening came first to the attention of the Asuriani, the Eldari of the craft worlds. Every Asuriani possesses some small modicum of psychic talent and it was thanks to the gradual sharpening and heightening of these that they came to register the growing swell of psychic energy spilling from the rift. For the craft worlders, this was a dangerous boon they had long ago honed their society to make use of, knowing well its dangers and guarding against them wherever possible. The more visionary amongst them realized, however, that this would not be the case for humanity. They sought to warn those imperial representatives with whom they maintained tenuous ties. Mankind were so widespread that should they suffer some sort of psychic apocalypse, all the other races of the galaxy would suffer as a consequence. The Xenos could provide agents of the Imperium with their warning, but they could not compel them to act upon or share it. Thus, the vast majority of humanity were still utterly ignorant of the danger as it began to manifest. There were signs, of course, that could be read by those with sufficient knowledge. The witch hunters of the Ordos Hereticus found themselves fighting an even greater number of malefic human psychers emerging from within the greater herd. The black ships were swiftly packed to the gunwales, many forced to turn home long before their rounds would normally have been concluded. Even the Silent Sisters, who patrolled the ship's holds, found themselves struggling to contain the ferocious powers of their abducted charges. The Adeptus Arbides and Planetary Militias logged instance after instance of psychic mutation. In many cases, horrific consequences followed long before those same local authorities were offered any aid by the distant Imperium. Though their subjects labored on oblivious, an even greater number of the Imperium's rulers and defenders were forced to acknowledge a disturbing truth. Humanity's psychic evolution had accelerated. Theories abounded as to why this should be. 
everything from linking the phenomena to the Great Rift, through to blaming it on the erosion of faith, pointing to supposed weaponized Xenos psi plagues, or even claiming that the Emperor himself was reaching out to touch his faithful and imbue them with his might. In the Talidus system, masses of imperial citizens and soldiers manifested powers that appeared divine. This earned them the moniker of humble saints, and saw the forces of chaos driven back, at least until the moment that those powers escaped their wielder's grasp with ruinous consequences. Across the systems of the Red Scar, imperial defenders were forced to waste valuable days screening tides of refugees for hidden witchery. When they should have been battling the Tyranids from which those refugees fled. Space Marine chapters found themselves struggling to handle the influx of psychic novitiates. Inquisitors and Imperial armies alike were forced to battle newly psychic overlords and self-proclaimed deities who had overthrown formerly loyal worlds. Chaos worship spiraled as power and temptation combined to transform even the lowliest imperial menials into dark cult magisters. As the emperor's servants came to appreciate the true scale of the threat, they did what they could to counteract it. Crusades were declared. Purging flames consumed entire settlements. In rare cases, entire worlds were put to death through the dread sanction of Exterminatus. Despite all this, it became ever more apparent that humanity would have to endure this perilous new evolution or be destroyed. Nor did the threat to the Imperium stem only from within. The psychic buildup affected all the races of the galaxy. Even those not as psychically gifted were rendered dangerously unstable or else driven to violent action by the phenomena manifesting around them. The orcs, for example, became even more aggressive than they had been in millennia. It was as though the background swell of psychic energy drove them into a frenzy of tribal aggression. More and more of their migratory invasions, known as wags, poured into imperial space either driven by expanding fringes of hungry warp storms, or else led by bellowing warlords. Around these latter, green energies leapt and crackled amidst the deep and booming laughter of monstrous gods. Though utterly without psychic presence, the Tao Empire found themselves beset on all sides by sudden and unnatural manifestations that their science could not explain. Determining the root cause of these nightmarish phenomena to be humans and other such warp-sensitive beings, the Tau became ever more intolerant of alien species, and ever more aggressive in their neutralization. The Tyranids were equally immune to the touch of the warp, their tendrils snaking heedlessly through even the most empirically unstable regions to strike at the Imperium from unexpected directions. Yet it was the Necrons whose response was perhaps the most frightening and dangerous. Though not themselves psychic, the ancient androids could nonetheless lose their worlds to manifesting demons and cataclysms. A galaxy overrun by metaphysical insanity was of no use to them. Accordingly, they applied their eldritch lore to the problem in an attempt to stabilize perhaps even neutralize the influence of the Immaterium upon real space. Amidst the veiled horrors of Warzone Pariah, the Imperium saw the barest hint of the damnation such an effort would unleash. Spirit-dead human colonies. Soulless husks with glassy, staring eyes. Worlds saved from madness, but plunged instead into silent sterility. This fate also the Imperium must resist with all their faith and strength. Lest in battling the madness of the warp, the Necrons should be allowed to drive the galaxy 
to an even more terrible fate.